with the King. Come worship the King. Oh, you gotta come. come worship the King. Good morning. Welcome to Sunday worship at St. Andrew's United Methodist Church in Garner, North Carolina. Greetings in the name of Jesus Christ to all who are following us on Facebook Live or who will join us later on Facebook or YouTube. God has been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were raised up, before the universe was even formed, God has been there for us. So let us live in God, rooted and established in the faith of Christ and abounding in thanksgiving. A few announcements this morning. Governor Cooper spoke last week about the current status of COVID-19 in North Carolina. As you know, if you've been following the news, we are now at a record pace with number of new infections, with number of hospitalizations, and the rate of positive uh, tests has gone up. Given that, the governor has uh, decided to extend phase three for at least three more weeks. In terms of what that will mean for our congregation, I don't know yet. Our reopening task force is meeting tomorrow night to make a determination. Regardless of that, next Sunday, uh, the 1st of November, is supposed to be outdoors. And so weather permitting, we will be outdoors at 11 o'clock. We had a beautiful Sunday last week, rainy this week. Maybe it'll be pretty next week, and we'll meet at 11 o'clock. A couple of things about that. Typically, November the 1st would be all saints, and we would remember the lives of those that we had lost in the past year. This is an unusual year because Election Day is on Tuesday, And so next Sunday, I will be talking, instead of the saints, I'll be talking about Christians and politics. And uh, my intent is not to stir up a lot of trouble, but simply to talk about what I think the biblical perspective on involvement in politics is. And then on the 8th of November, the following Sunday, we will honor our saints. And so if you have loved ones who have passed away in the last year, it would be great if you could email us uh, a picture of them that you particularly cherish, and we'll try to put those in the slide presentation that will go on Facebook Live, if possible. I haven't asked my team about that yet. (laughs) I may be asking for something we can't do, but I would love to have those pictures. If nothing else, we'll put them on Facebook. Um, (laughs) They're back there laughing now because I I, uh, threw them a curveball. Don't forget our Tuesday and Thursday evening updates at 7 o'clock, our Thursday evening coffee house at 8, coffee house and bingo. And remember that we're not uh, permitting small group gatherings, even socially distanced, on our church property until uh, further notice. Fall Festival is coming up this coming Saturday, October the 31st. We have almost 20 cars now for trunk or treat. Uh, A couple of things that we've been asked, and that is if you are trunk or treating, please let us know. Let Doug or Stacy know. Uh, You can go back to your church chats and find the email addresses. If you have... uh, help to bag candy, please bring that candy. Don't keep that home and eat it. We need to use that. Uh, it's all socially distanced. It will be drive through, and we're the, right now the weather forecast is for beautiful weather next Saturday. Moving to our joys and celebrations, I simply want to thank our media team back there for uh, being so flexible and, and moving everything back into our worship space inside after having everything set up last week for outdoor worship. I do appreciate all that they do. It takes a lot of time. I suspect it takes them more time to prepare for the services than it does me. And so I appreciate very much all that they do. If you have other celebrations, uh, please feel free. We'll take a moment of silence for you to call those out aloud wherever you are uh, so that the Lord can hear them and you can hear yourself saying them. Let's take just a few seconds to call out our celebrations. Let's move on to our prayer concerns. Continue to pray for those in our congregation who have lost loved ones since this pandemic has started. Uh, Pray for their comfort. Pray for them to be able to move forward with the many challenges they face now that they've lost the love, uh, the life of somebody who is near to them. Pray for those in our congregation who have health issues, and there are many. There are those who have had surgery recently and are still recovering. There are those who are dealing with injuries or illnesses not necessarily COVID-19. I've known of uh, just a few people in our congregation to have COVID, and there probably are others who have it who simply don't want to share that information. We pray for all of them, and we pray for those who are receiving treatments or having to undergo tests. 
It's a perilous time to be out in public right now, and hospitals feel especially dangerous. We pray for all of our shut-ins. We have some folks who are simply not able or not willing to go out during these uh, terrible times. And we pray for those who, because of this, are very lonely and very anxious. We lift up those who face other challenges at work or at school, teachers and students, or in relationships, uh, marriages, and other significant others, and those who are facing challenges with children, grandchildren, or parents. We lift up the state of North Carolina as we are now a hot spot for COVID-19. Um, uh, this was predicted that there would be a fall sp- a spike. Part of it is certainly people relaxing uh, and not remembering the three W's. Part of it is probably due to other factors that we don't, tr- don't fully understand because uh, in 1918 and 1919, the flu surged in the fall as well. Pray for our country as we are continue to lead the world in the number of COVID deaths, and we're soon going to reach six figures in new infections per day, which is unimaginable. Um, this is not just happening in our country. I read this this morning that Spain has now imposed a national curfew because they also are experiencing a surge, and you may remember Spain was one of the hot spots early on in this pandemic. Pray for our country as we approach our election and the political debate, discourse, yelling, threats, heat up. And pray for the people of Artsakh uh, in Armenia who continue to be under siege from uh, Azerbaijan and be threatened by Turkey. I want you to pray for St. Andrew's United Methodist Church and our leaders as they discern what the path forward for us should be tomorrow night. It's a very difficult decision with so many things involved. Continue to pray for our finances. We have had a very unusual year. Our giving has gone down. Our expenses have gone down more than our giving, which was unanticipated. But we continue to have financial needs, and thank you for meeting those. And pray for our community. Uh, our, our community is excited about coming out for our fall festival and anything that any local church can offer them that is safe because uh, folks are tired of being cooped up in their houses and tired of not being able to celebrate and enjoy life. And so we pray for our community and the many challenges that our neighbors face around us. If you have other concerns, let's take a few seconds for you to call those out now uh, in the privacy of your home or your car or wherever you're worshiping. Thank you for continuing to support the mission and ministries of St. Andrew's United Methodist Church with your financial gifts. If you're able and willing to continue doing that, you can go to our website, www.standrewsumc.org. The online giving button is at the top. It's green. Or you can send a check to the church at 1201 Maxwell Drive, Raleigh, North Carolina, 27603. Or you can come by and put it in our secure mailbox. Again, thank you and God bless you. I want to build a house upon this mountain Way up high where the peaceful waters flow To quench my thirsty soul Up on the mountain I can see for miles up on this mountain Troubles seem so small, they almost disappear. Lord, I love it here, up on the mountain. My faith is strengthened by all that I see. You make it easy for me to believe. this mountain keep the pain of living life so far away but I know I can't stay up on the mountain I said I'd go Lord wherever you lead for where you are is where I most want to be and I can 
tell we're headed for the valley. Yes, yes, we are. My faith is strengthened by all that I've seen. So, Lord, help me remember what you showed me up on the mountain. Yeah. You bring me up here on the mountain for me to rest and learn and grow. I carry it to the world so far below So as I go down to the valley Knowing that you will go with me This is my prayer, Lord Help me remember what you showed me Up on the mountain Cherish these times up on the mountain, but I can leave this place because I know someday you'll take me home to live forever up on the mountain, up on the mountain. Up on the mountain, our scripture this morning comes from the Older Testament, the book of Deuteronomy, chapter thirty four, verses one through twelve. Deuteronomy thirty four, one through twelve, if you'd like to find that in your own Bible. Then Moses went up from the plains of Moab to Mount Nebo, to the top of Pisgah, which is opposite Jericho, and the Lord showed him the whole land, Gilead as far as Dan, all Naphtali, the land of Ephraim and Manasseh, all the land of Judah as far as the western sea, the Negev and the plain, that is the valley of Jericho, the city of palm trees, as far as Zoar. The Lord said to him, this is the land of which I swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. I have let you see it with your eyes, but you shall not cross over there. Then Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab at the Lord's command. He was buried in a valley in the land of Moab opposite Beth Peor, but no one knows his burial place to this day. Moses was 120 years old when he died. His sight was unimpaired and his vigor had not abated. The Israelites wept for Moses in the plains of Moab 30 days. Then the period of mourning for Moses was ended. Joshua, son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom because Moses had laid his hands on him, and the Israelites obeyed him, doing as the Lord has commanded Moses. Never since has there arisen a prophet in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. He was unequaled for all the signs and wonders that the Lord sent him to perform in the land of Egypt against Pharaoh and all his servants in his entire land, and for all the mighty deeds and all the terrifying displays of power that Moses performed in the sight of of all Israel. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Moses is one of the most significant figures in Judaism. Since Judaism was the religion of our Lord, we should know as much about it as possible. And it only makes sense that we'd want to know as much about Moses as we can. The basic facts about him are well known. He was born around 3,500 years ago during a terrible time for the Israelites. They were enslaved in Egypt. At that time, the most powerful nation on earth. And the Egyptian king, the Pharaoh, had decided that they were a threat. So he ordered the Israelite midwives to kill Israelite baby boys as they were being born. Moses' mother put him in a reed basket and set the basket on the Nile River, praying that some kind Egyptian would rescue her baby and raise him safely in a loving home. The daughter of the Pharaoh found him and raised him in the palace as an Egyptian prince. His name, Moses, 
means son in Egyptian. I read that story, that part of it, last Sunday from Exodus chapters 1 and 2. And I discussed Moses' early life in the context of God's providence. Providence is the word for how God's will works in the world. Does God intervene in human affairs? Does God do miracles? Does God cause evil to happen or let evil happen? Or is there something else at play? These are profound questions that we all ask. In my experience, times of great suffering usually draw these questions right out of us. And that's when we cry out, why did this happen? Why am I or my loved ones suffering? Is there any purpose behind this pain? My answer last week, and it's one that's taken most of my 59 years to discern, is that God made the universe with randomness or unpredictability built in. Randomness is necessary for new things to happen. Unpredictability allows us free will. And this was no accident. God made the universe this way because we can't love without freedom. We are made in the image of a freely loving God, so we had to be free too. And that's where suffering enters in. Some suffering comes from natural processes like disease, aging, and injury, which are a product of randomness. Some comes from our misuse of free will when we hurt each other or ourselves. I said God doesn't cause evil, but God is with us through all our suffering, guiding and comforting us and bringing something good out of it even when we can't or won't see it. And that's providence in a nutshell. Last Sunday, I placed the sad history of the Jewish people in that context. Today, I want to say more about the rest of the life of Moses. Much later in his life, God appeared to him in a strangely burning bush that burned without smoke or heat, produced only light, and told him to demand to go to Egypt and tell the Pharaoh to let the Israelites go free. Pharaoh would not agree to this, though, until God had sent ten plagues to punish Egypt, each plague worse than the last. And after the last plague was over, Moses led God's people out of Egypt toward the promised land. Then the Pharaoh changed his mind, and he sent his army out to bring the Israelites back. I talked briefly about that last week. The Egyptians caught up with the Israelites as they reached the Red Sea. They were trapped, but God parted the water, and Moses led the people to safety. The Egyptians followed them, but the sea closed over them and drowned them all. As the Israelites slowly made their way across the desert, they eventually reached Mount Sinai, which is south of modern-day Israel. God sent Moses up the mountain where he received the Ten Commandments, the basic rules of human conduct. These would guide God's people and form them into God's people if only they would obey them. But while Moses was up on the mountain, the people regressed, and they built a golden calf, an idol, It's as if they forgot all that God had already done for them. But that's how people are. We're grateful until the next crisis comes along. God wanted to wipe them out and start over, but Moses persuaded God to relent. And God did. Moses then continued to lead the people closer to the promised land, but they weren't able to enter in until all of those responsible for doubting God had died, and that took 40 long years. When they were finally within sight of home, God showed Moses what was next, but he wasn't allowed to enter with his people. He died at the age of 120, and his life story ends with this. Never since has there arisen a prophet in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. He was unequaled for all the signs and wonders that the Lord sent him to perform in the land of Egypt against Pharaoh and all his servants and his entire land. And for all the mighty deeds and all the terrifying displays of power that Moses performed in the sight of all Israel. It's easy to talk about Moses' good qualities because there were so many of them. Last week I mentioned Moses watching an Egyptian slave master beating an Israelite. And as my grandmother would have said, it ran all over him. Moses' heart was filled with outrage at the injustice. Have you ever seen something so cruel and unjust that you got sick to your stomach? That was Moses. He had an unwavering moral compass. Moses was also a man of great faith. 
when God told him to do something, he did it. He left behind a comfortable, safe life to confront the most powerful man on earth, the Pharaoh. He led God's people through the Red Sea. Imagine how terrifying that must have been. So he was obedient and faithful, and clearly he was brave. All of those are outstanding qualities. Moses was compassionate. That's obvious from the story about the slave being beaten, isn't it? But I also said that Moses begged God not to kill the people, even though they had done such a stupid and disobedient thing as build an idol. Moses couldn't stand the thought of them suffering because of their weakness and ignorance. And I guess that story shows his courage again, doesn't it? Because would you bargain with God like that? Moses did. It took 40 years to get the people safely from Egypt to the Promised Land. For four whole decades, they lived under harsh conditions in the desert with only, a, with only quail and a miraculous bread called manna to eat. <clears throat> Moses must have had great determination to persevere for so long. He wouldn't give up, and he wouldn't let the people lose hope. So let's recap those positive attributes of Moses. He was morally just. He was faithful and obedient to God. He was full of compassion. He was brave. He was patient. He was as tough as nails. And God rewarded him for all of these things. When Moses came down off the mountain, his face was radiant with God's divine glory. He glowed in a supernatural way. The only other person I remember in Scripture that that's described in that way is Jesus coming down off the mountain after his transfiguration. We're told in our Scripture today that God revealed himself face to face with Moses. That is a very rare thing in Scripture. So I could end the sermon right there and I could say, now go and do likewise, be like Moses. And I wouldn't be wrong, but you need to hear the rest of the story. Do you remember that Egyptian slave driver who ticked Moses off? Do you know how Moses stopped him from beating the Israelite? He killed him. He murdered him. And then he buried the man's body so nobody would know what he had done. Moses didn't turn himself in. He didn't try to justify the killing in a court of law. He tried to hide it. Then somebody threatened to expose him, and instead of staying to face the music, Moses ran with his tail tucked between his legs. He ended up in Midian, all the way across the Red Sea from Egypt. And there he became a lowly shepherd, and he married and settled down. And I wonder if he ever told anybody in Midian what he'd done and how he ended up there. Probably not the kind of thing you'd tell people, is it? What do you think about that part of the story? Moses, the greatest figure in Judaism, the religion of Jesus Christ. The Bible itself says Moses was the greatest of all the prophets. Moses, the one whom God called to deliver God's people and give them the law. All that. And also, Moses the murderer. Moses the liar. Moses the coward. The man had an awful temper. And it got him in trouble so often that eventually it was the reason that God would not allow him to enter the promised land. To use another of my grandmother's saying, Moses showed his rear end to God one time too many. Wait, there's more. Remember what I told you about God speaking to Moses from a burning bush? I said that Moses accepted God's call to go confront Pharaoh, thus showing his faith. What I didn't tell you is that Moses made five excuses for not going before he ever went. It's all there in Exodus 3 and 4. I'm not making this stuff up. Here was excuse number one. Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? As if God didn't know who Moses really was. This is called a diversion, folks. Moses simply did not want to go. His excuse, hey, you must have the wrong guy, God. Who, me? Now, maybe that's understandable. Moses knew what he had done, and he knew how he had basically gotten away with it. So maybe he felt guilty and unworthy. And he had been living as a shepherd, a blue-collar worker for 40 years, and maybe he wondered why would God call somebody as flawed, as ordinary as he was. Excuse number two. But Moses said to God, if I come to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask me what's his name, what shall I say to them? 
Seriously, Moses? God speaks to you in person and you ask him this question? Hey, I can't go unless I know your name. Another delaying tactic from a reluctant man. So God tells him what to say, but that's not good enough. Excuse number three. Then Moses answered, but suppose they don't believe me and listen to me, but say the Lord did not appear to you. You know, it makes you wonder if Moses even knew who God was, doesn't it? Had this been me and my father, by this point, I would have already been whooped. But God is patient, so he gives Moses proof, a staff that he can turn into a snake, a leprous hand that can be healed in the blink of an eye, and he'll be able to turn the water from the Nile River into blood. Surely that will make the people believe. Still not enough. Excuse number four. Moses said to the Lord, O my Lord, I have never been eloquent, either in the past nor even now that you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. He just doesn't want to do it, does he? I'm slow of speech and slow of tongue. Well, maybe he really was. Maybe he had a speech impediment. So God tells Moses not to worry. He'll put the words in Moses' mouth. And then Moses wraps it all up in excuse number five. Oh, my Lord, please send somebody else. So in Exodus 4.14, we read, Then the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. God has finally had enough and tells Moses that his brother Aaron will speak for him. I wonder, were you aware of this part of Moses' story? Or did you think that he was a superhuman biblical hero? I could go on. Moses was whiny. When the Israelites got out in the desert, free from the Egyptians, but hungry and tired, they started grumbling about Moses' leadership, which is what the people do when they're hungry and tired. And here's Moses in Numbers 11, starting at verse 11. Moses said to the Lord, why have you treated your servant so badly? Why have I not found favor in your sight that you lay the burden of all this people on me? Did I conceive all this people? Did I give birth to them that you should say to me, carry them in your bosom as a nurse carries a sucking child to the land that you promised on oath or to their ancestors? Where am I to get meat to feed all these people? For they come weeping to me and say, give us meat to eat. I am not able to carry all these people alone, for they're too heavy for me. If this is the way you're going to treat me, then put me to death at once. If I found favor in your sight, and do not let me see my misery. Can you believe that? Why are you doing this to me, God? And if this is the way you're going to treat me, just go ahead and kill me and get it over with. Do you get that? The people are being childish, but it's all God's fault. How dare God burden Moses with responsibility for these weak rebellious people and it would be laughable but I can hear my own voice in Moses whining I feel that same despairing ingratitude sometimes when my own congregation vexes me bottom line folks Moses was a wonderful hero called by God and used by God to do remarkable things and Moses was a murderer and a liar and a whiny stubborn doubter who constantly put God to the test. It's possible for both of those things to be true. In fact, it's inevitable. In our own way, each one of us resembles both the good Moses and the bad Moses. If you doubt me, think about the other people that God used in the Bible. The great King David, uniter of Israel, ancestor of Jesus, and David the mercenary, a man who killed people for money, who actually hired himself out to the Israelites' enemies. David the skirt chaser, who stole a man's wife and then had that man killed to cover up the crime. Or what about the great Simon Peter, the foundation stone of the Christian church? Also, Peter the uneducated day laborer with a terrible temper. Peter who betrayed the Messiah and abandoned him at his hour of greatest need. You know, we talk a lot about Judas Iscariot's betrayal, but what about Peter's? Are you getting this important lesson from the life of Moses? God doesn't want only pious, devout, smart, clean, good-looking people. God can use anybody, even a murderer, a liar, 
a disobedient rebel, a hired killer, an adulterer, a disloyal jerk. If God wanted Moses and David and Peter and so many others, then God might want you and me too. And God might even be able to use us to do incredible, unimaginable things. There are people in every church I've served who want me to be perfect. They want me to be the best preacher they've ever had, the most effective administrative leader, the most compassionate, hardworking chaplain, and they want me to do it all with a warm sense of humor and a smile always on my face and have good health and an endless supply of energy. But I'm not like Jesus. I'm a lot more like Moses. Some know my flaws all too well. I step on toes when I preach. I talk a lot from my pulpit about justice and compassion for everybody, which apparently in 2020 is something that only a Democrat can do, even though I'm not a Democrat. I don't have the same pastoral care philosophy or priorities as a congregation's all-time favorite pastor, therefore I am deemed to be bad at it. I'm not always an outgoing person. It drains me to be outgoing, but I'm judged for being an introvert even though I was born that way. I have health problems. I have bad days, even bad weeks, and I can't fix it. Now, I haven't murdered anybody yet. I haven't raped anybody. I haven't taken bribes. I haven't taken any blood money. I've never cheated on my wife or cheated on my taxes. I would never willingly betray my Lord, but nothing pushes my buttons harder than accusing me of being dishonest. I will show my anger. And I feel sorry for myself a lot more than I should, especially if somebody has hurt my feelings. I am not proud of my shortcomings. I am not proud of my flaws. I beat myself up for them way more harshly, more savagely than anybody else ever will. And despite that, God still manages to use me. Somehow or other, God can reach people through my sermons, my prayers, my visits, and even my stupid jokes. So you see, if, somebody, if God can use somebody as flawed as Moses, if God can use somebody as screwed up as Van Spivey, then God can use you too. And you're never too old for this to be true. God didn't even get started with Moses until he was 40 And then God didn't call him to serve until he was 80. And then God didn't call him home until he was 120 years old. Imagine that. Nobody is too sinful or too damaged or too sick or too old for God. But why are we surprised to hear this? This is the same God who created the universe, who parted the Red Sea, who became a human being, who died and was raised from the dead, and who lives forever. This is the same God who makes us and saves us and loves us and is with us always. A king once had a prized diamond. As he held it up to the light, perfection glinted from each facet. This gem would become the crown jewel in his magnificent crown. One morning the king awoke and found, much to his dismay, a single crack descending down the face of the jewel. The greatest jewelers in the land were called to look at the stone, but nothing could be done. The crack ran so deeply down the face of the diamond that any effort to fix it would further damage it. Finally, one jeweler, a simple man from a neighboring village, stepped forward. He claimed he could save the diamond. The king laughed. The greatest craftsman in his kingdom had seen the gem and considered it hopeless. How could this ordinary jeweler hope to do anything? Seeing, though, that he had nothing to lose, the king told the jeweler that he could spend a single night with the diamond. If he fixed it, he would receive a great reward. If not, he would receive a great punishment. Locked in his room, the jeweler took a good long look at the stone. It sparkled like the fire of the sun on the surface of still water. He could see that the crack could not be removed without destroying the jewel, so what could he do? The next morning, the jeweler came out with the stone in his hand and a look of triumph on his face. When he produced the gemstone, the entire royal court, the queen, the ministers, even the jester, erupted in an uproar. The scratch hadn't been removed. It was still there, but the jeweler had etched a rose, the symbol of the kingdom, on the face of the diamond, using the thin crack as its stem. 
The king rose from his throne and embraced the jeweler. Now I truly have a crown jewel, he said. My diamond was magnificent, the best I'd ever seen, but it was no different than any other beautiful gem. Now, though, I have a unique treasure, unlike any other. Folks, what if the thing that we think is our worst attribute is the very thing that God is using to make our life a perfect work of art in his eyes? Let me ask that again. What if the thing we think is our worst attribute is the very thing God is using to make our life a perfect work of art in his eyes? You know, the world is a hard place. From work to health to marriage to family to school, nobody gets everything they expect out of life, and some people get very little that they hope for. It is what it is. That's life. Rather than letting our flaws and our setbacks defeat us, can we instead take heart from the life story of Moses, who despite being his own worst enemy, despite facing terrible obstacles, kept on keeping on until he was given a vision of the promised land. In the end, God will use the broken pieces of our warped lives and our shattered dreams to produce the beautiful mosaic that is our life story. So keep the faith, brothers and sisters. May the glory of the Lord shine upon you and shimmer through you and shed God's loving light into this dark time for some lost soul who desperately needs it. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Let us pray. Wonderful God, whose glory the heavens declare and whose handiwork the whole earth sees, be with the astronomers and astronauts and naturalists, be with the artists and photographers and poets, creating God whose spirit brooded over the face of the waters and brought breath to all that lives and grows, be especially with doctors and nurses and medical researchers who are fighting viruses and other illnesses. Incredible God for whom truth is not merely facts and figures but relationships and the gift of eternal love. Be with those whose knowledge has left them empty or whose technology has become their master. Unimaginable God who gives us faith that might lead to many doubts and deep doubts that might lead to a larger faith. Be with all those who doubt, be with those who despair, and be with all those who are pure of heart, who hunger for you. Infinite God who has created us for fulfillment and joy and who does not rest while one lost person suffers. Be with those who are lost in mindless pleasures and material possessions. Loving God who, should our mother and father forsake us, cherishes us as your very own family. Be with abused children and street kids. Be with social workers and foster and adoptive parents. Healing God who when darkness covered humanity leapt into the night bringing light and joy. Be with those who work at night. Be with law enforcement and firefighters. And be with those who work in spiritual darkness, evangelists and counselors and pastors. God, whose firstborn perfect child covered our sins and bore our griefs. Be with all mothers and midwives. Be with those who are falsely accused and those who are oppressed. Strong God who banishes fears and brings a new dawn, who swallows up death and victory. Be with those who risk their lives for others and be with all those who this day face death. Perfect God, all-knowing God, all-loving God, who knows our needs before we can say them and who does far more for us than we can ask or imagine. Be with us as we offer all these prayers and be with all of those who have forgotten how to pray. And help us all to pray as Jesus taught us, saying together, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. If you'd like to, I would invite you to stand wherever you're, you are, unless you're in your car driving, and I wouldn't attempt it there. But if you're at home, stand, put your hand on somebody's shoulder or grab somebody's hand. We have been given another week in which to honor a God who is easy to love by loving the people around us who are sometimes difficult to like, much less love. Journey into the wilderness of tomorrow and remember to wear your mask and wash your hands and wait six feet apart. And as you go, keep on keeping on like Moses. And may the blessing of the living God be yours always, now and forever. Thanks be to God. Amen and amen. Thank you.